Welcome to One Plus One. I'm Pat Turner and welcome to my country. This is the place of my birth, Alice Springs, in Bantua country, the country of the Aranda people. It's a place of extreme natural beauty. You must all visit one day to see how beautiful it is. Pat Turner, welcome. Thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. We're here at Mbantua, Alice Springs, your country, Arunda land. Tell me about growing up here. What was it like? Well, it was good. You know, we, had, we were surrounded by lots of Aboriginal families. We had lots of friends. Everyone looked after everyone. We we're all poor as church mice. So, you know, we just helped each other and, and got along. You reach over and tilt a tiny bit. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yes, guys. Thank you. Okay. Put the window up. Okay. To the right. Now here. You put your indicator on. It must just look like a completely different place now. Yeah. Too. It's this block uh, was the area that I grew up. So if we just turn to it's the left in line, this yeah. first street. Yep. All the Aboriginal families lived here. Yeah. Uh, in this area. There was a real sense of community, wasn't there? There was, yeah. So this is my old primary school. Right here. When the supermarket used to be on the corner, so we used to ride up to the supermarket, get our apple, and that's the primary school. We all went there. Watch out for these people. Hey. <laughs> we drove around town throughout today. What was that like, reflecting on some of those places that you probably haven't been or had time to go to for such a while? Yeah, brought back nice memories and uh, remembering, you know, how far we used to ride to school as primary school kids and so on, from the Gap to Hartley Street Primary School. Uh, just being up on Anzac Hill, you get a lovely perspective of the whole town. But it's the country that really draws me home. So, Dan, that's what is commonly known as the Gap. And that was a natural border for the Aranda country. So any visitors that were coming from other language groups had to wait at the gap and light a fire. So the Aranda people could see them and send a messenger down to find out who they were and what they wanted. And they'd go back and tell the elders and if it was okay by the elders, they would give permission for them to pass. So, you know, it's a long-standing practice to be welcomed onto other people's country. And I guess the welcomes and acknowledgements that we see in here today are really an extension of that protocol and law, aren't they? That's right. Adapted to today's times. Yeah. And it's a very important thing to do uh, because it's part of our culture, it's our custom, and it shows respect to our people. It's the country that draws me home. It's just in my, in me. It's in my bones, it's in my spirit. The different colours in the landscapes, you know, the mauves and the oranges and the reds and the beige and the beautiful muted greens that you get from the eucalypt and, and all the different vegetation in Central Australia. I want to talk about your parents and start with your dad first and the work that he did in those early years, that really hard work to set up the home and, and the life for your family. How do you reflect on him? Well, I reflect on him as a very hard-working man and he was, you know. Uh, he, had, uh, he was a windmill contractor. Um, he had a beautiful green Mercedes truck that was his pride and joy and that would be loaded up with all of the materials to construct the windmill and the troughs and the tanks. And uh, he'd head off out bush, usually with a worker or two with him, and they'd be gone for weeks, you know. Come back when they finish the job, they'd take all their food supplies and whatever. My dad was a well-organised man, had a well-organised camp and, you know, uh, and a good man. So that's how I remember him. And because we saw him 
so infrequently, it was always great when he came home. You were 10 years old when he passed. What did that mean for you? And what did it mean for your mum? Well, it was devastating, absolutely devastating for the whole family. I mean, my mum hadn't worked. She was at home looking after us kids. We were all little, you know, so we had no breadwinner. Thank God he had built the house. So this is where I spent most of my life, living from grade four until the start of third year high school. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in this house. So this is the same old fence that was here. And the same number is on the, on the gate, 26, that from when I was living here, um, all those years ago. This was all lawn. And we used to sleep out here on the lawn. Counting the stars. Count, yeah, well, the falling stars and the satellites and, you know, yeah. and telling the stories about the configuration of which star, where the Milky Way was and, you know, all of those things, yeah. But my mum had to eventually go out and get work to support us, and she did. Um, you know, and it was hard manual labour, you know. She ended up uh, working in the kitchen at the hospital, washing the pots and pans. You can imagine what that was like. In fact, she had to retire because she got really bad uh, dermatitis from the washing up. Um, so when she retired, she then came to live with me in Canberra. So she lived with me for 30 years before she passed. And so we were best friends, really. It must have been really hard losing your best friend. What was her influence on you? Well, she was very strong and independent. Uh, she was a member of the Stolen Generation. So her and her sister were removed from their family from a place called Billingurry, uh, where her family lived. And the police just rode in there and picked up her and Auntie Katie and took them hundreds of miles overland on horseback and sent them to Carlin Compound. So my mother grew to be a very resilient woman and she knew that I wanted to have a good education. I grew up in a time of uh, great change in Australia with uh, the women's movement, the civil rights movement was happening in the United States. We were all following that. We had the Vietnam moratoriums, you know, all of that protest era was happening. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in those times, very impressionable young teenager. You grew up listening to your uncle, well-known civil rights uh, activist and advocate, Charlie Perkins. What was it about his stories uh, and his experiences that really stuck with you? His commitment to make sure the right thing was done in recognising the rights of Aboriginal people. And, um, you know, his absolute determination and dedication to that was just, you know... And he used to always talk about having the fire in the belly and the backbone to stand up. And I embraced that to the full. My nana lived straight here. Yeah, right. She was in one of the cottages right here. So that was great, you know. And of course, family would come to visit nana and we'd see them all. So you'd all, yeah. always be able to stay connected. And every Christmas, Uncle Charlie would come home and we'd sit around outside under the, in the shade, having cups, endless cups of tea, they were, and talking about all the civil rights uh, stuff that he was doing. And, and that's where I really, you know, I was only a kid, 10, 11, you know. That's when I started to click about the treatment of Aboriginal people in Australia from a very young age. Charlie became the first Aboriginal man to graduate from an Australian university in 1966. You were there. That's really kicked off that love and passion of education achieving, didn't it? Well, I had... I was always interested in education. I was a very good student right from the start. I mean, I insisted on going to kindergarten before I was old enough, and I went. Um, what, ha what happened there? Oh, well, my brother used to go 
the little bus used to come around every morning from the Anglican kindergarten, pick him up, and I thought, how come I can't go? So I figured out if I got dressed and jumped in the bus, I could go. So they let me go. And I went to kindergarten probably a couple of years before I started primary school. Um, loved school, absolutely loved it. And I was inspired to get a good education because I'd gone with Nana Hetty to Sydney for Uncle Charlie's graduation from university. And I was sitting there in the Great Hall at Sydney University when he received his degree. And I said to myself, well, he can do it, I can too. And I was only about 11, 12 years old. You know, it was just a role model. And, you know, and it just gives you that determination to make your family proud. So this is the old Alice Springs Telegraph Station, as a lot of people refer to it, but we call it the bungalow. And uh, my nana worked here. So that's my grandmother there, you know, Hetty Perkins, and she was the cook. So the bungalow had become a place where half-caste kids who were removed, forcibly removed, uh, were institutionalised. And my uncle Charlie was born here on the kitchen table, just next door. All the Aboriginal families have connections with this place in Alice Springs. And it's a very important place to us. But not only is it important in terms of the stolen generations, it's a very sacred place. The water hole at the bungalow. And then over the hill is Walachathara which is a very sacred women's site. You mentioned that your mum was a member of the Stolen Generations. How did that impact you? Well, she was in the top end, of course, so she was taken to Carlin Compound with her sister, Katie. I never got to meet Aunty Katie. She died before I met her. After the police had removed mum and Aunty Katie from Nana Harriet and uh, Grandpa, they went back and took the boys and they put the boys over at Garden Point. And then the youngest boy, Uncle Tim, he was sent to St Francis in Adelaide. Mum wouldn't talk about it. But, you know, as a teenager, I was, I would pump for questions all the time. And I said to a lady one day, you can talk so openly about what happened with you, Mob. But my mum won't, she said, you have to remember the pain it causes and the hurt, you know. They didn't ask to be taken away, they were just kids. And a lot of them were very, you know, traumatised by that experience of not growing up with their mother and thinking that they'd been abandoned. So I then used other ways of raising the issues and mum told me the stories. But I guess it was my persistence and my determination to understand and explain to my mum why it was so important that I understood the history of what happened to her. At what impact or, or how did that shape you as you worked through the public service and in really senior public official roles? Yes, well, I only ever worked to make sure that I distributed resources directly to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's the only reason I ever worked in the public service but I learnt the system. And don't forget, I rose from the bottom to the top. Let there be no mistake, information is power. And we as Koori women should be hungry for it. So I worked my way through and as I went through the ranks, I learnt all of the things that I needed to know about how the system worked, how to use the system to benefit our people in their communities right around the country and to look at it from a national perspective because we had pretty limited resources really to distribute and so I learnt about assessment of need versus you know the squeakiest wheel. So while I was still at university I became vice president of FCATSI, the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. I was probably the youngest in my 20s but I learnt from Uncle Joe McGuinness and you know Evie Scott they were very 
close friends of mine, but they were also my mentors. And they were old fighters. They are the giants whose shoulders we stand on, you know. We would sit for hours and yarn. But it was so invaluable to me because it shaped my whole determination and my commitment to ensure that we get equality and that our rights are fully recognised in this country. And that's a lifetime commitment and I haven't tripped up on it yet. Tell me, what did you make of Kevin Rudd's apology to the members of the Stolen Generations? Well, look, it was very timely and uh, thing, but I, I have said it was a cut price apology. Every member of the Stolen Generation should have been properly financially compensated. The difference between us growing up and a lot of white kids our age was that their parents owned their own homes. We were lucky, and my family was lucky. But had the stolen generations been properly compensated, and I think at least a million dollars each, would have established them with a family home and a, you know, that they could leave for their children in the future. And uh, that would have contributed to, uh, you know, dealing with the pain and the trauma and assisting them knowing that they could leave their kids in a better state than what they had inherited, you know? Um, so I felt that uh, the apology was timely and it was very nice the way it was delivered. It was the start of the Closing the Gap, which I'm still working on today. In that sense, it was good, um, but we're taking a very different approach to it now than was taken in 2008. You, you talked about that fight that, that your uncle had and perhaps even your nana as well. It, it seems like that's a real family trait in the sense of... Well, I think it's an Aranda trait. <laughs> so it's bigger than the family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, your, it's your mob, it's your people. Yeah, we're desert people, mate. We're survivors. Oh, I know what that's like. I grew up just up the road here. But you wanted to create structural change from within, but also yeah. making sure that Aboriginal people were always at the table yeah. making the decisions. Absolutely. That's been central, hasn't it? Absolutely. Much of my journey, there were a few contemporaries that I came through the public service with. We were really up against it. So I had to work, you know, twice as hard to get recognised and produce the work at a rate that, you know, deserved the promotions and the recognition. And it paid off, you know, because I ended up as CEO of ATSIC. And, uh, and I ran an excellent administration. I was all about openness, transparency and accountability. And that was to our people as well as to the Australian public and the use of the taxpayers' money. I never had a qualified audit as the CEO of ATSIC. It was not a corrupt organisation, despite how people like to characterise it. In the early days, ATSIC was so powerful that even Hawke government cabinet proposals to do with Indigenous affairs were run past it for approval first. Since those heady days, ATSIC's influence has been in slow decline and the organisation has been a study in decay. Its reputation, even among some in the Aboriginal community, has been sullied by what's been seen as a prevailing culture of corruption, nepotism and mismanagement. We believe very strongly that the experiment in uh, separate representation, elected representation for Indigenous people has been a failure. We can't help who's elected in any democratic process. We've got a few nutcases in parliaments around Australia. And of course, we had a few elected in the elected arm of ATSIC. And that happens in a democratic process. So, you know, why we were judged uh, so much more severely, I think, was based on racism rather than any good practical uh, uh, reason of, you know, uh, it's just the political whim of the day which is why Albanese's proposal to have a voice enshrined in the constitution is so important. And I really would encourage the Australian people to support the yes vote because in Aboriginal affairs, in my, and I'm 70 years old now, 
every step we've taken has been an incremental step that we've had to compromise for to accept the incrementalism in the improvements uh, for us as Aboriginal people. And the voice is only one part of the Uluru Statement because truth and treaty are next. Yeah, well, you, you've seen how Aboriginal people advocate for change now with it, from within government, from outside it, and you've been part of advisory groups to create a voice to parliament. What change do you think it would make? Well, it'll give a direct say uh, on advice that's sought by the parliament, by Aboriginal people who are elected as representatives from around the country, and give them the opportunity to have a direct input into improving policy and legislative responses that will go to impact uh, on our people. Um, so it's a direct opportunity. It doesn't negate the existing uh, community controlled organisations who play an important role now and will continue to play an important role. It doesn't negate the work of the Coalition of Peaks uh, who ha have a national agreement with every government in Australia to close the gap. But neither does having a voice negate the responsibility of government to fulfil their obligations under the national agreement and close the bloody gap between our people and other Australians. I know most Australians are fed up with the inequity. They want to see people living a decent quality of life. And I applaud them for that and I ask them to continue to support us in doing that. And broader monitoring. We regard this um, as akin to a national emergency. Today, in an unprecedented crackdown, the Prime Minister moved to take control. Among his sweeping changes, dozens of extra interstate police will be sent in. But here on your country, in Central Australia, there are conversations about the impact of the emergency response, the intervention, conversations about crime in recent months. Do you think that a voice to Parliament would make a difference and have an impact right here? I hope that it would. Young people sneaking into locked buildings, smashed windows, CBD assaults. What happened in Alice Springs was an after effect because they were the generation of the intervention, right? These those young, those kids, young people. Those yeah. kids who were mucking up, they were born when the intervention started, OK? That's how young they were. And all our power was taken away from us, all of it. We were shocked that the Prime Minister and his ministers are finally admitting that there is a major problem in our communities. We are equally dismayed that Mal Brock is drawing too heavily on his military background to swoop into our communities and do a quick fix. So we had a hell of a battle with the intervention and we will never stand for another intervention by any other government. We've had enough. It did so much damage. But it was decades of neglect of investment in our communities right around Australia that has led to the situation. Your CV, Pat, is pretty impressive and extensive community welfare officer, senior levels within the public service, deputy secretary of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, deputy secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, CEO of ATSIC, just to name a few positions. What is it that's linked those? What is it that drives you? The determination to achieve justice for my people. That's what drives me. But I had some other good stints too. I was um, Professor of Australian Studies at Georgetown University for 18 months at Washington DC. I guess the job that I'm most proud of, really, is the establishment of NITV. And I did that after I left the public service altogether. So 2007, I was appointed as CEO of NITV. NITV is the home of Indigenous storytelling. I understand you started with just a laptop and a phone. Actually, that's where I first met you. I was a very young journo yes. and, and got my cut my teeth in 
political reporting and TV reporting there. Why, out of all of your extraordinary career, has that been such a, a highlight? Well, I knew that having our own television service would be uh, the biggest influencer um, to get into Australian lounge rooms and hear the stories by us, about us, and, you know, and for us as well. But I knew it would be a great educator. We want a unique service. We don't want to be the same as everybody else. I wanted to have Aboriginal filmmakers, Torres Strait Island filmmakers, creating their own content, coming up with their ideas, growing that pool of talent and expertise. <laughs> it's a dream come true. Whoa, 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 yeah. Lately, you've been well known around the country for your advocacy around the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait yes. Islander Australians, uh, speaking out during COVID-19 to protect mob as the head of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation we know as NACHO. Uh, and you've had a big hand in the new framework of really driving that around closing the gap and that, that refresh is, I think, yep. the term that, uh, that you coined there. Uh, how do you feel the pace is going and, and what are the major hurdles? It's too patchy and it's too slow. And, and it goes right back to after the 67 referendum when the Commonwealth assumed responsibility in terms of legislating, having the power to legislate for Aboriginal people. They are not engaging face to face across the table with Aboriginal leaders who know what is needed in their communities. And they are not taking the programs out of government and giving them to us to run as fast as they should be. So if they did that, we would get be much better results and we've demonstrated that. Nacho led on COVID. We saved thousands of lives. Whereas the Navajo and many other First Nations people internationally were devastated by COVID, we were not to the same extent. We're very saddened by the lives that we did lose. And um, if we could have prevented that, we would have. Um, but the measures that we did take certainly saved the lives of thousands of our people. From your early years of activism, leading change within the public service, uh, creating a media organisation, now working in health advocacy, what, what role do you feel you have now as an elder? And what does eldership mean to you? Well, I don't really take much notice of that. Um, because in, the, in my eyes, an elder is a law person where I come from. And so they are the holders of our cultural knowledge and they have the authority and that's who I call an elder. I mean, I'm getting older um, and I should have retired, um, but I've got too much to do. So I value the respect that I get from the younger generation and, um, and I appreciate that and I try to reciprocate by encouraging them to step up and, and take the reins. Uh, that's what I want to see. Because um, there's so many of us who've been at this for decades and we need to be able to spend some time enjoying uh, a less pressured and hectic life. Pat Turner. Thank you so much for joining me on One Plus One. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.